Another alternate theory to the resurrection is the hallucination theory. Sometimes it's been suggested that perhaps Jesus' disciples merely hallucinated, but uh, psychologically this is most implausible. One, one perhaps might hallucinate, or maybe another, but everybody, and hallucinate the same thing. Jesus appears to Peter, to the 500, to James, and to Paul. He appeared to a group of the apostles, he appeared to the eleven, he appeared to more than 500 witnesses at one time, he appeared in Jerusalem, he appeared in the vicinity of Jerusalem on Emmaus Road, he appeared in Galilee. Now, if you're going to concoct a theory that says, oh, this was a, a, a hallucination, even a mass hallucination, then actually what you've got to do is concoct a theory that says there were multiple mass hallucinations in a variety of places at a variety of times over a 40-day period. A friend of mine, a clinical psychologist, recently surveyed the uh, psychological literature and there's no confirmation of group hallucinations. So the fact that groups thought they saw Jesus as groups, that's a huge problem for hallucinations. It would be one thing if there was just a appearance of Jesus near a tomb to a bunch of hysterical men or women. Okay, in their grief, they, they, there was this wish projection thing that happened and they so wanted to see Jesus again that they imagined they saw him. Well, the truth of the matter is that the reports, the earliest reports we have of to whom Jesus appeared, where and when, do not comport with this theory. For one thing, Jesus appeared to people that, he, that didn't believe in him before the crucifixion. One hallucinates with something that's already in one's mind or thinking. And the, the fact is we know that James didn't believe in Jesus until after the resurrection. It wasn't in his mind to think, gosh, Jesus might rise from the dead. And of course, the last person Jesus appeared to was Saul of Tarsus, an anti-Christian. Somebody who persecuted Christians, took them off to trial, had them executed in Jerusalem. Saul had not been one of Jesus' followers. Saul did not believe in Jesus, didn't think for a moment that he was the Messiah or that he'd been raised from the dead. Another point would be, some people would say that, the, that maybe the apostles were, were just so despairing after Jesus, their leader they'd been with for three years, had died and suffered so tragically under the Romans uh, that they're just going just crazy, thinking, oh, well, maybe he'll just somehow rise from the dead. It's pretty hard to be confronted with the reality of crucifixion. Your best friend torn from you, killed, and you're supposed to spring back just a few days later and say, oh wow, I think he's doing fine. I saw this view of him. Psychologically, that's very, very difficult to deal with. So it doesn't seem like they were in the right frame of mind. These are people who saw their master horribly crucified by the local authorities initially cowering behind locked doors for fear that they would be next on the hit list. And something transformed them remarkably into bold witnesses right in the very temple precincts in the heart of Jerusalem where Jesus had been crucified. Hallucination is a full tomb theory, not an empty tomb theory. If someone sees an hallucination, the body's still in the tomb. We have more than 20 reasons to believe that the tomb in which Jesus was buried was later found empty. Others would say that uh, the disciples, perhaps the women in their emotionally tormented and confused uh, state, uh, simply went to the wrong tomb, found it empty, and people began to believe in the resurrection. If the disciples went to the wrong tomb, all the authorities needed to do was to point them back to the right tomb. An idea like that condescends to the Jewish people in the first century, suggests they're foolish and stupid, they, they, they can't keep track uh, of a body. The Jewish people in uh, the first century took burial very seriously because the friends and family would want to know where their loved one was buried because their hope would be to gather his bones a year later and rebury them according to the Jewish custom. This wasn't a common tomb. It was Joseph of Arimathea who was a very wealthy man. It was a tomb that would be very unique and very expensive, not a common Jewish tomb. From the language that both Mark and Matthew use about the rolling of the, of the stone, you know, they rolled the stone in front of the, the tomb and rolled it away, that means that the stone was rounded, which Probably 95% of tombs in the first century used square stones. 
To have a rounded stone was very expensive, and only the very wealthiest people would use that at that time. And so the fact that it was a rounded stone for Joseph of Arimathea would make that tomb stand out and be quite memorable. It would be very hard to mistake it for somebody else's.